Is the U.S. setting the stage for military conflict with Iran? As tensions rise between the two sides, will the tug of war in the Persian Gulf lead to an open war? Hello and welcome to Bigger Than Five with me, Rida Fakhri. The Trump administration is deploying an additional 1,500 military personnel and a dozen fighter jets to the Middle East. The Pentagon says this is in response to, quote, Iran's plans to attack the U.S. and its interests in the region. The buildup is making many here in Washington nervous about a looming military confrontation, despite the recent softening of Trump's tone. It all started when U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton announced the deployment of an aircraft carrier battle group to the Gulf in reaction to what he described as troubling threats from Iran, without providing any specific evidence. Tehran is now threatening to reconsider its obligations under the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the nuclear agreement that President Trump withdrew from last year. Trump also slapped on Iran the harshest financial sanctions ever imposed on any nation. So what do Iranians think about this so-called maximum pressure campaign? We gauge the mood in Tehran and Mashhad, the two largest cities in Iran. Donald Trump رئیس جمهور آمریکا انجام داد تو این قضیه نشون دهنده این بود که میشه هر قرارداد و هر رابطه‌ای به نمری و هر موافقتنامه‌ای به نمری رو به راحتی زیر پا گذاشت و هیچ کانسکوئنسی هیچ چیزی نداشته باشه براش و خیلی راحت میتونه این کار رو انجام بده و با یک استفاده از یه قدرت برتری یه قدرت تجاری بقیه کشورها رو وادار کنه بر علیه این روش غلطی که پیش گرفته جلو بره و هیچ کس هم نتونه چیزی بهش بگه کاملا حق با ایرانه ایران تنها مونده به نظرم این اتفاق اتفاق بدی بود و یک دستاورد بزرگی مثل برجم و که باعث شده بود من فتحان صادقه هستم پجاشگر علوم اجتماعی من هم به عنوان یکی از مردمان ایران در موردش نگرانم اما فکر میکنم که شاید اینها خیلی توی رسانه داره جدی تر نشون داده میشه یه جورایی اونطوری که رسانه داره نشون میده ایران و آمریکا در آستانه جنگ هستن من فکر نمیکنم اونقدر جدی ما واقعا در آستانه جنگ باشیم بابت اینکه اصلا آمریکا اجماع جهان یعنی اصلا در واقع همراهی نداره برای این جنگ فعلا خوش آمد. من محمد میرشایی هستم مدیر بازرگانی خارجی شرکت زعفران مستقب به حس خوب ایجاد نمیکنه به خاطر اینکه حداقل از منظر اقتصادی و تجاری تا پیش از تحریما ما میتونستیم که زعفران و محصولات توزیع غذایی و اساسا کالا به آمریکا صادر بکنیم اما با آغاز تحریم ها و خروج آی ترامپ از برجام الان این موضوع متوقف شد و دیگه ما نمیتونیم با وجود این موضوع الان جلو این کار گرفته شده با در نظر گرفتن این که 90 درصد زعفران جهان در ایران کش میشه و بازار آمریکا و بازار سایر نقاط جهان به زعفران ایران وابسته است این اتفاق خب سایه انداخته و ما از این مسئله خیلی ناراحت هستیم مثلا همسر من توی مجموعه صنعتی خودروسازی کار میکنه و نبود مواد اولیه باعث شد که بخش عمده از بخش مهمی از منابع انسانیشون شغلشون رو از دست بدن من یه خواهر دارم که مبتلا به MS هستش و داره یه سری دارو مصرف میکنه بعد تحریم ها خب این دارو ها هم کمیاب شد و هم بسیار گرون شد من مرجانه هستم، خبرنگار فرهنگی و ساکن مشهد. این اولین باری نیستش که ما مورد حجوم تحریم قرار گرفتیم و آخرین باری هم نیستش که با تحریم مواجه میشیم. من با توجه به سنم و از اونجایی که یک جوان آرمانگرا هستم فکر میکردم که این اتفاق باعث میشه که رونق اقتصادی کشور ما بهتر بشه و من منتظر این اتفاق بودم ولی از اونجایی که ما همیشه در معرض جنگ داخلی هستیم خودمون این اتفاق نیفتاد ما نمیدونیم توی برهوتی هستیم که نمیدونیم چه اتفاقی برامون میفته و این خیلی سخته 
So while crippling U.S. sanctions continue to damage the economy and affect the Iranian people, how is Trump's policy being viewed here in Washington? I'm joined by Thomas Shannon, who served as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 2016 to 2018. Ambassador Shannon also served as Acting Secretary of State in early 2017. Ambassador Shannon, you just heard what many Iranians feel, resentment towards the U.S.'s punishing sanctions. Why is the U.S. administration now willing to go even further by provoking a military confrontation? As far as the administration of President Trump is concerned, uh, in the aftermath of his decision to pull out of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, his purpose is to find a new basis on which to engage and negotiate with Iran. And the sanctions are part of that. But what new basis? Because he keeps saying, although his tune keeps shifting, uh, but he keeps saying that he isn't interested right now in regime change. What he's interested in is making sure that the Iranians have no nuclear weapons. Why then didn't he stay in this deal that by all accounts was working and still yeah. is? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and I personally uh, was a supportive of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA. Uh, and during the previous administration, at the beginning of this administration, uh, worked through our joint commissions uh, with our P5 plus one partners and the Iranians to ensure its compliance. Uh, and it was working. Uh, but as you know, uh, this was an important issue for the president during his campaign, an important issue for, for many Republicans in our Congress. And the president decided that the deal was not worth staying in. So then the question is, what comes next? And in order to get to the negotiating table, he and his national security team determined that uh, they needed to return to a sanctions-based regime in order to begin some kind of negotiations process. It seems, for anyone looking at this, that he was never really interested in improving relations with the Iranians. I mean, clearly he seems to need Iran as a bogeyman, not just to galvanize his base, but also to satisfy his Gulf allies and Israel. From the beginning, he's expressed, and I've heard him, he's expressed an interest in establishing some kind of dialogue. The question is uh, on, under what ground rules. Sure, and, but, but and actions speak louder than words, surely, don't they? I mean, why is he sending all these uh, military assets to the Gulf region? I think it's evident that they were very concerned about certain Iranian actions that they perceived as potentially aggressive and which could potentially put American interests and personnel in, in danger and decided to send a clear message about uh, how Iran should or should not behave. So I would separate that from uh, what the president, I think, is trying to do. And his, his recent comments in Japan showed this out, uh, of a desire to engage with Iran in some fashion. Well, I don't know. Many would, would argue with this. Would you agree that he is, in many respects, provoking the Iranians? This is what one senator said. He said the Trump administration has taken a series of very provocative actions that risk miscalculation, risk the Iranians taking steps in response to that provocation that could light fire and create a war. What, what's a provocation or not depends on how you view it, I guess. Uh, my, I think the president's purpose is to try to bring additional pressure on Iran in order to convince it to sit down with, with him and his team. Whether that's successful or not at this point is really a big question because it appears that the Iranians are not interested in sitting down at this point and don't believe that the environment is conducive to the well, kinds well, of negotiations. Well, do you blame them? Because as you well said and pointed out, in fact, in one of your uh, Senate speeches back in April 2016, you acknowledged and you mentioned it earlier. You said, while we are encouraged by Iran's adherence to its nuclear commitments thus far, I want to emphasize that the JCPOA did not resolve our profound differences with Iran. It never was intended to. This was no. a nuclear deal. Do you not. blame the Iranians for feeling the way they do? Because after all, they were not in violation of this deal. The IA and every other signatory to the deal said they were, they were actually keeping their yeah. part of the bargain. It is the U.S. that violated the agreement. At, I mean, at the end of the day, um, the, the challenging aspect about uh, the JCPOA is that it's not a treaty or an accord or even an agreement. It's a plan of action. And it was negotiated in such a way that it did not have to be presented either to the American Congress or to the Iranian parliament. Well, Ambassador, be with respect, it was more than a plan of action. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an accord, an international treaty, an international agreement not. that was endorsed by the UN Security Council. But please, but let, let's, let's get this straight. Because in the United States, treaties have to go to the United States Senate in the same way that many foreign agreements have to go to the Iranian parliament. As a career diplomat, do you think it's useful for the U.S. to walk away from its agreements? I do not. And I supported the JCPOA, and I still support the JCPOA. I think it was a remarkable uh, work of negotiating by all the parties involved, 
Um, and I regret that the United States has pulled itself out of that uh, deal. But this is the reality we're in right now. And so now the question is, what comes next? So what comes next? How well, much of a coherent strategy is there? And which Donald Trump do we believe? The Donald Trump who says he's not looking for regime change or the one who tweets about bringing an official end to Iran? Yeah, an, an, an excellent question, obviously. And the way in which this administration has chosen to communicate its purposes and its intentions uh, can sometimes confuse. But I guess the, the important point here is what the president said in Japan is striking. Uh, because by indicating that he's not interested in regime change, that he's focused on Iran's nuclear capabilities, actually reopens a space uh, for at least a discussion. If I were advising President Rouhani or the Supreme Leader, uh, my advice would be take the president at his word. Listen to what he said. Yeah, but and, which word? That's the problem. I, it's I, a I lot of very I, confusing signals. And confusion sometimes is part of a larger international game. So you don't think it's wise and you do not see the likelihood of a war? At this point, I do not. Um, assuming that there's no miscalculation or misstep by either side. I don't think war is in the best interest of the United States and I don't think war is in the best interest of, of Iran. But I would argue uh, that the president has actually opened a space for Iran to take advantage of now with his most recent comments. And I think they should call him on it. They should call him on it. But how, how much of a door can it actually open when the U.S. administration has been pursuing the so-called maximum pressure policy, punishing Iran with sanctions, sanctions that obviously are failing because China just upped its import of oil uh, last month with uh, 700,000 barrels a day. India, we just heard, was actually going to start importing Iranian oil bypassing U.S. sanctions and paying for it in rupees. And we know that the Europeans as well have put together this mechanism to circumvent U.S. sanctions. So, so would you say that these sanctions have failed miserably? They've not failed miserably. Um, based on the previous clip that you showed of Iranians talking about the impact of sanctions, it's evident that this is something that has affected Iranians in, in a significant way and in a worrisome way. Uh, but that doesn't mean that... But yet you don't say it has failed even though it has brought the Iranian economy to its knees and the regime is still standing, as you can see. No, the, but again, the point here is not to bring down the regime, according to the president. The point is to bring them to the table. And it's the same policy that... But that, that doesn't well, sound right, Ambassador, because to bring them to the table, they were at the table. You had them in a deal, in I an agree. agreement that they were respecting. I agree. No, and again, I'm not arguing for this. I'm just attempting to explain what I believe... But, but can you explain is, it? Is, ...is the approach of, of this administration. And uh, I, 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 I do think that um, given the words of the president uh, and uh, given the circumstances that we face right now, finding channels of communication that we can open between our two countries to ensure that there are no misunderstandings or missteps uh, between and among our militaries uh, to avoid any um, unnecessary and unexpected uh, conflict between our two countries um, is important. But then we have to find a way to reopen a, a, a larger conversation between Iran and the United States. Ambassador Tom Shannon, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. The tense relationship between the U.S. and Iran dates back to the 1979 revolution when Iranians overthrew the American-backed Shah. Over the years, that antagonistic relationship continued to deteriorate until a glimmer of hope at the end of the Obama administration. So how then did we get to the current crisis? Aus Haidari takes a look. After years of negotiations, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, was reached between Iran, the P5 plus one, and the European Union. Iran agreed to limit its nuclear activities in return for the lifting of sanctions. The countries represented in this room achieved what decades of animosity and rhetoric did not, a long-term deal that closes off every possible path to building a nuclear weapon and subjects Iran to the most comprehensive nuclear inspections ever negotiated. As a result, Iran stopped operating two-thirds of its centrifuges and reduced its uranium stockpile by 98%. But with the stroke of a pen, President Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the agreement. We have terminated a terrible, terrible deal that should have never, ever been made. His administration imposed new sanctions on Iran's oil and banking industries. It also designated the Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization. The Iranian regime has a choice. It can either do a 180-degree turn 
from its outlaw course of action and act like a normal country, or it can see its economy crumble. The standoff continues over U.S. demands that Iran stop supporting armed groups in the region and stop building ballistic missiles that could threaten America's regional allies. And now, Iran has decided to hit back. This is the same JCPOA that states if the other parties are failing to meet their obligations, then we can also reduce our obligations in the deal. Today we are announcing a reduction of our obligations under the JCPOA. President Hassan Rouhani is also threatening to step up uranium enrichment and begin reconstruction of Iran's main nuclear reactor. It is giving Europe until June to find a solution that saves the agreement and protects Iran's oil and banking sectors. Meanwhile, the drumbeats of war are getting louder with the deployment of the USS Abraham Lincoln aircraft carrier to the Gulf, including the strategic Strait of Hormuz. But for now, both sides are downplaying the possibility of military confrontation. I think it's fake news, okay? Now, would I do that? Absolutely. But we have not planned for that. Hopefully we're not going to have to plan for that. Let me make it clear that Iran is not seeking confrontation, but will not escape uh, defending itself. And so the question now is, what happens if no solution is reached in this latest U.S.-Iran standoff? To talk now about the geostrategic and political implications of all this, I'm joined by Jamal Abdi, president of the National Iranian American Council, and David Pollock, fellow at the Washington Institute and former senior advisor for the broader Middle East at the U.S. State Department. David Pollock, you support more pressure on Iran. You believe the sanctions are actually scaring the Iranians. Is there any proof of this? And would President Trump be threatening military force if indeed the sanctions were working? What he has said very clearly, especially in the last few days from Japan, is that the United States has no intention either of attacking Iran or of pushing for regime change Why should we take Iran. that seriously, though, but when we see all of the military yeah. uh, right. vessels the military, and so on that he sent to the Gulf, going, not to mention the 1,500 right. military personnel? The military, military personnel. are going there in case Iran attacks us first, in which case we will respond. But it's a deterrent force. It's not an offensive force. Jamal did you buy that? It's a deterrent force. I think that the, the idea that Donald Trump has said anything clearly uh, is uh, doesn't quite uh, match with reality. He was on Twitter a week ago saying he would end Iran. Um, now, all of this is caveated with, you know, it's if Iran strikes the United States, mm -hmm. which to me it looks like, you know, this is a policy that John Bolton is pushing forward. And it's really, it's this game of reverse chicken where each side is daring the other to strike first so that they can justify what they want to do. And really all this does is it, it crowds out you know, moderate voices on either side of the debate. It militarizes the debate. Um, and I think that there is a, sm a, a, a powerful faction within the Trump administration that does want a war with Iran. And I think there are factions within the Iranian leadership that does think that military engagement with the United States would actually, actually be a positive thing for their political standing in the but country. But what's the likely outcome, David Pollock? Who is calling the shots? Is it yeah. John Bolton and those who want war? Or no. President Trump? I mean, are we really to believe yeah. his call for Japanese mediation? Are we to take more seriously the fact that he has engaged in a very serious military buildup? Well, it's both. But I, uh, first of all, I think there's no question that it's Trump who's calling the shots, as you put it, or calling the not shots. In other words, not to start military action against Iran. It's Trump. And uh, I think that's very clear. Um, but I again, think it's a confusing message, because if it were Trump, then right. he obviously would not be itching for war like many have been, not just within his cabinet, and you mentioned John Bolton, but MBS in Saudi Arabia and Netanyahu, as we both know, have a very clear agenda and both really want to see some kind of a a conflict, some kind of a military no, they, resolution they don't want, to this. they don't want a conflict. They want, they want the U.S. to contain Iran and to roll back some of Iran's subversion and support for terrorism and military intervention in other countries and militias.
that it supports in places like Lebanon or Syria or Iraq or Yemen. Yeah, that, that they want, but uh, they, they want to do that. And they are providing intelligence to the United States. Sure. Is the U.S. willing, do you think, Jamal Abdi, to go to war at the behest of its Gulf allies in Israel, based on the intelligence they have been providing it? I think John Bolton has made it very clear what he wants. He has been saying for years we should bomb Iran. He said at the height of the nuclear negotiations the United States should bomb Iran. He seems to have this notion that with some limited strikes on Iran's nuclear facilities, the uh, population is going to rise up and depose the government. Um, I think that potentially these recent uh, maneuvers and positioning, you know, B-52s and the aircraft carrier in the region was uh, intended to try to put this new pressure on the Iranian government because maybe the administration is buying its own propaganda and thinks that there is this uh, this groundswell that is ready to change regimes. But I don't think things are that easy. But and, David and Pollock, there are serious concerns, mm -hmm. uh, including among some people on Capitol Hill, senators yeah. and congressmen, sure. who believe that Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton, and Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of, of State, are both hyping the intelligence in a very highly politicized way to push Trump down the path of war. I mean, again, it's very reminiscent of what we we learned, or at least what happened during yeah. the Iraq invasion, where, again, Bolton was once accused of slanting intelligence yeah. to justify that, uh, that military action. I think probably um, the, the, the comparison with the run-up to the Iraq war is not very useful, because each situation is different. I, I think there are enough similarities between <laughs> what happened in 2002 and what's happening today. Uh, you know, these, these meetings that John Bolton is doing at, the, at, at Langley, at the CIA, uh, this investigation that's now underway on how the State Department is politicizing this annual report and removing information about Iran's compliance with the, the, the nuclear agreement. Um, I mean, look, it's not an exact comparison, but we see enough of the same things happening and there are enough of the same actors now in the driver's seat in the administration that to not at least take this very recent lesson from history, seriously, I think would be a, a failure on the part of analysts uh, in D.C. as well as the American public. Yes. Some people would argue yes. that Israel has been playing a very instrumental role in escalating the tensions between the United States and Iran. Right. How significant do you think is the Israel, UAE and Saudi Arabia axis? Because just last February at a Warsaw meeting, Prime yes. Minister Netanyahu himself said uh, that he attended a meeting with some Sunni Arab diplomats and they talked about advancing, quote, the common interest of war with Iran. No, that's a mistranslation, actually, is it? of what he He's said. He's been yes, quoted it is. as saying this. Yes, it's a mistranslation. They tweeted it. He, it was a mistranslation that was it translated. It was their own mistranslation. Yes, it so was. So it did come from the Israelis. Yes, Israelis. it was a mistranslation. They tweeted that out. Yes, it was, and it was a mistranslation. And that was not deliberate? What he said was of confronting Iran, not of war with Iran. And yes, there is a very strong common interest that Israel shares with the United States and with Saudi Arabia and with the United Arab Emirates and in fact with most other Arab countries in confronting Iran's terrorism, subversion, military intervention and sectarian militias that threaten the sovereignty and the interests of all of those countries and of the United States. You call it Iran's terrorism. Uh, Jamal Abdi, uh, the Iranian foreign minister recently tweeted about the US sanctions calling them economic terrorism. I think if we get into debating what is terrorism and what is not, that's probably a pretty treacherous road. I think the fact of these sanctions, though, is that it's not designed to achieve any policy outcome. It is designed to punish ordinary Iranians, destroy society there, and with this, with this hope that Iran is going to, become the, going, going to become this destabilized country, the regime is going to collapse, and then in the vacuum, some democracy will emerge, which I think is, you know, pure fantasy. David Pollack, are we to take President Trump at his word when he says he can live with this Iranian regime? All he's looking for is, quote, no nuclear weapons. Donald Trump has said all along, not just most recently, but from the very beginning, that he can live with the regime in Tehran as long as it changes its behavior, but not just on the nuclear issue, also on its support for terrorism and subversion. So where do we go from here, Jamal Abdi? Because as long as John Bolton is closely surrounding the president, and we all know that not only has he been working for many years with fringe extremist elements outside of Iran to foment some kind of unrest and bring about the collapse of the regime, the MEK is one example, he has said openly 
that he is for regime change. Yes, his national security advisor, John Bolton, is somebody who said, the behavior of this regime can't change, so we will change the regime. He said this. These are his own words as a civilian just before he came into the White House. Uh, I think when Donald Trump does get involved in this issue, he sees what the end game actually looks like, and that's where you see him pulling back and saying, we don't want military action, we don't want, want regime change. But if he's saying all we want is no nukes, well, we had a deal that actually provided verifiable proof that there were no nukes. And so for him to pull out of that, nobody knows what the strategy is. He doesn't even know what the strategy is. And I think the end game we're leading towards is one in which there's no diplomatic option. I don't think the Israelis, the Saudis, the UAE have any interest in the United States actually engaging with Iran, which is why they helped to torpedo this deal. And so the end game that that puts us on a path to is either military conflict or this, this continued simmering Cold War that is inevitably going to lead to some tripwire where there is some exchange that could lead to a war. All right, we'll have to leave it there. David Pollack, Jamal Abdi, thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. So whether the Trump administration gets dragged into a military confrontation with Iran at the behest of its Gulf allies in Israel remains to be seen. Whatever Trump's ultimate aim may be, what is clear for now is that despite his recent statements downplaying the risk of armed conflict, the U.S. will continue its economic and psychological war against Iran, regardless of the dangers of a regional fallout. From Miri Dafakhli and all the team here, thanks for watching. See you next time.